Isaac wants a useful way to depict various aspects of a firm's decision on what type of inputs to use in order to maximize profits. Isaac wants are defined as combinations of inputs that yield the same level of final output. For the particular versions that we will be using, we will assume that the firms have neoclassical production functions. That is to say that they exhibit constant returns to scale, diminishing marginal returns to an individual factor. The particular examples we'll use will have capital and labor used as inputs into final production. Factors will be mobile between industries without restrictions. And finally, we will be assuming that the firms are perfectly competitive in both final product markets and input markets. The traditional way to depict isoquants is in a graph with the horizontal axis as labor and the vertical axis as capital. So we will be depicting the amount of capital and labor, in this case two units of capital and one unit of labor that are used to produce 10 units of the final output Y. Notice as well that we're depicting an isoquant where there is no substitution between capital and labor. This is a special case where capital and labor must be used in this proportion, two to one, two units of capital, one unit of labor, in order to produce any level of final output. This means, for example, if we increase the units of capital to five, but retained only one unit of labor, we would still only produce 10 units of the output. Similarly, if we kept capital at two and increased labor to eight, we would also produce only 10 units. In this instance, the isoquant for this particular type of technology is depicted by the red line. Again, this is the case when there is no substitution between capital and labor. It must be used in this proportion, two to one. So if we wanted to increase output, we would have to increase both capital and labor, for example, to four units of capital and two units of labor. Because it's a constant returns to scale technology, if you double the inputs, you'll double the output to 20. In this instance, the family of isoquants representing different levels of output will all have this same distinct right-angled shape, regardless of the level of output. This also means that there will be a constant level of capital labor ratio for this technology. The KL ratio is always the same, regardless of the level of prices for labor and capital. So whenever people talk about a kind of industry which is very inflexible, it always must use inputs in always the same proportion, the exact number of workers, the exact number of machines, one for one, or any inflexible combination like that, this is the kind of isoquant that's associated with that idea, a very inflexible kind of, of technology. So now we want to bring in the cost side of the equation for the firm. Because the, the firm is going to be looking to minimize costs in order to reach a certain level of output or equivalently to maximize profits. So first we want to have a depiction of total costs for the firm. And those total costs are made up of labor costs, which are equal to the wage multiplied times the number of workers used, and the capital costs, which is the cost of machinery, which is equal to the return to capital R multiplied by the number of units of capital. You can rearrange this equation, solving for capital, where the slope of the line is the relative cost of labor, the wage-rental ratio, and that is the trade-off between purchasing labor or capital to produce the output. That wage-rental ratio will play an important part in many of the later aspects of what we do. The other part of the equation is the y-intercept, if you will, which is the total cost of outlays divided by the return to capital. That is to say, the maximum amount of capital that can be purchased 
for that given level of a cost. total outlay by the firm. You can also depict this graphically in the following way, where the green line represents the equation of that line, the slope is the wage rental ratio, the y-intercept is the total amount of capital that can be purchased, and the x-intercept is the total amount of labor that can be purchased for the same level of cost. Now suppose the cost of capital increased. Holding the wage fixed and the total amount of capital fixed, that will change this trade-off between labor and capital. In particular, the wage rental ratio will fall because R has gone up while W remains the same. If the total outlay stays the same, the x-intercept remains the same, and the curve rotates downward. Now this will change the way capital and labor will be chosen. In the case of the no substitution between capital and labor, the rotation of this cost constraint for the firm will reduce the amount of output but will not change the capital labor ratio because there is no substitutability between capital and labor. That is to say the final use of capital and labor will be along this same purple dotted line with this constant combination of capital. So this outcome reflects the inflexibility of this type of production technology. The cost of capital goes up, the firm not only reduces the amount of capital, it also reduces the amount of labor that is used because it must keep these two in the same proportion. Firms with this type of production technology are very vulnerable to changes in input costs. Now we want to move on to another extreme, that is to say where capital and labor are perfect substitutes so that the firm can use capital and labor indistinguishable between one another. So for example, if a level of production of 20 units required 8 units of labor, 8 units of capital, but alternatively the firm could use 16 units of capital, no units of labor, or alternatively 16 units of labor and no units of capital and still get to that level of output of 20, this red line, this isoquant, reflects the isoquant when there is perfect substitutability between capital and labor. In this circumstance, the firms will be very sensitive to slight changes in the cost of labor or capital in choosing whether or not to use one or the other. Now, suppose that the wage was exactly equal to the cost of uh, capital, so that the wage rental ratio was 1, which happens to be exactly the slope of this isoquant. In that event, the firm would be indifferent between any combination of capital and labor that happened to be on the red line. You use 16 units of capital, no units of labor, 16 units of labor, no units of capital, or any combination in between. As long as it fell on the red line, the combination of, of capital and labor, the firm would be happy to, per, uh, to purchase that amount of capital and labor. But this is a razor's edge. If the wage rental ratio is anything different than one to one in this case, then the firm will choose to use only capital or labor. Say for example that we started out where the wage rental ratio was slightly greater than one. In that instance, the firm would face relatively higher costs of labor and would only use capital. That is to say, it could only reach the level of output associated with the red isoquant by choosing only 16 units of capital. Labor would not be chosen at all. The firm would completely specialize its production in the use of capital. Now, if the wage rental ratio was slightly less than one, slightly less than the slope of the isoquant, the firm would go in a op completely opposite direction. In that case, labor is cheaper and it will only choose labor and no units of capital. Again, a razor's edge. But these two is examples where capital and labor are either perfect substitutes or not substitutable at all are the rarity. In general, there's imperfect substitution between capital and labor. That is to say, 
a firm has some ability to go back and forth between the use of the two, but not perfect substitutes. Capital and labor can be used in different proportions, and that proportion of the use of the two will depend on the relative cost of labor and capital that the firm faces. That is to say, the wage rental ratio, the slope of this cost curve that we've been talking about before, will once again play a role. So here we have a capital and labor combination that yields a level of output, in this case equal to 15. Now suppose this level of 15 units could be accomplished with either 8 units of capital and 5 units of labor, or 7 units of capital and 8 units of labor. This means that different combinations of capital and labor, different proportions, can be used to produce this same level of output. These different combinations are also associated with different capital labor ratios. Eight units of capital compared to five units of labor is a higher capital labor ratio than for the other combination. So the question will be which combination to use, and that will depend on the labor cost compared to the capital cost, the wage rental ratio. So once again we'll bring in the cost side of the equation. The total cost curve depicted in capital labor space with the slope of the line equal to wage rental ratio so that the cost of capital and labor will determine the optimal amount of capital and labor given by K1 and L1. This is the maximum amount of output for this level of cost. And it is represented by where the isoquant is tangent to the cost line. That is to say the slope of the cost line equals the slope of the isoquant. And this slope of the isoquant is known as the marginal rate of technical substitution. It's the change in capital compared to the change in labor. That's the slope of the isoquant. One can show that that marginal rate of technical substitution is equal to the ratio of the marginal productivity of labor compared to the marginal productivity of capital. That is, the trade-off between capital and labor on the production side equals the productivity of one input compared to the other input. So if we say that the Equilibrium condition is where the slope of the isoquant, that is to say marginal productivity of labor compared to the marginal productivity of capital equals the slope of the isocost line, then that means that MPL divided by MPK is equal to the wage rental ratio in equilibrium. Let's examine this relationship more closely. First let's start with the slope of the isoquant. First, let's consider a change in output along an isoquant. You can write this expression in the following way, where dy means the change in production. It's equal to zero because we're holding output constant. This change can be broken up into various parts. One is the marginal productivity of capital. That is to say, how output changes if one extra unit of capital is employed. If we multiply that times how many extra units of capital are actually increased, then that's the total contribution of extra output as a consequence of changes in the use of capital by the firm. Of course, the output can also change because of changes in the use of labor. So for that, we use an analogous analysis with the marginal productivity of labor multiplied by the change in the use of labor to get the total contribution of output as a consequence of changing labor usage. We can then rearrange this equation where the left hand side is the slope of the isoquant, dk, change in capital, compared to the change in labor, and that is equal to the negative of the ratio of the marginal productivities of labor and capital in the industry. In other words, this is giving the trade-off between capital and labor 
along a given isoquant because output is held fixed. So let's give a concrete example for this. And so let's imagine, for example, that the marginal productivity of labor is 10y per worker, and the marginal productivity of capital was 5y per unit of capital. This would mean that the ratio of the marginal productivities, that is the slope of the isoquant, would be equal to 2 units of capital per one unit of labor. That is the trade-off in production along the isoquant. Now let's do the same thing for the ISO cost line. Recall that its slope is W over R. If the wage is equal to $20 per worker and the cost of capital is $10, unit, $10 per unit of capital, then the slope, the wage rental ratio, would be also equal to two units of capital per laborer. Another way to say this is that workers are twice as expensive as capital to produce one unit of the output. So this allows us to give an interpretation of this long-run choice of capital and labor, that is to say when capital and labor can be chosen in whatever proportion the firm wants. The optimal choice of inputs depends on the relative costs of those same inputs. So that the optimal choice of the inputs is such where the relative price equals the relative input productivity relative cost equal to relative benefit. As in the other examples, we want to examine how the use of capital and labor will change for this type of firm if the cost of labor relative to the cost of capital changes. So in this particular example, let us suppose that the relative cost of labor increases for the firm. This will increase the slope of the ISO cost line, i.e. the wage rental ratio will increase. And let's suppose, at least for this example, that we are examining what the combination of capital labor would be to reach the same level of output of 15 units. So the cost curve rotates into a steeper line and the firms will respond to the relatively more expensive labor by substituting capital for its use to say K2 and use of labor of L2. So notice that the capital labor ratio increases as the wage rental ratio increases. This also has an important influence on the marginal productivity of labor and capital. The wage rental going up is associated with higher capital labor usage. Higher capital labor usage means higher marginal productivity of labor, lower marginal productivity of capital. And this is consistent with labor becoming relatively more expensive and relatively productive as well. So to summarize what we've learned about isoquants, they, are, they depict combinations of capital and labor to produce certain levels of output. We've analyzed the situation when there is no substitution available between the factors. In this case, the wage rental ratio is irrelevant in the sense that it doesn't change the relative combination of use of the two factors. The capital labor ratio stays the same. If there's perfect substitution between the factors, and that capital labor usage is extremely sensitive to small changes in the wage rental ratio. Firms will either be indifferent between combinations of capital and labor, or if the wage rental ratio slightly changes, they will only use capital or only use labor. The more frequent circumstances when there's imperfect substitution between the two. And in this case, the wage rental ratio will always equal the ratio of the marginal productivity of marginal productivity of uh, labor and that capital and labor usage changes smoothly as the wage rental ratio changes and it is this latter example which is the more commonly used example in neoclassical economics.